Hey folks, Quilly Teen here and welcome to another episode of Let's Play Aurora 4X and I have some exciting news to reveal. Let's go ahead and hide the asteroids for a second. Actually, um, let me do... Only show me asteroids that have colonies on them, just to thin that out. There we go, simplify things. Plus we got some little dwarf planets and weird things and stuff going on. Okay, I have finished sending a fair amount of automated mines to Wolf Harrington. Let's go and take a look at it. Now, I didn't send all 50. I sent 44. I didn't quite finish the job. And the reason for it was Wolf Harrington is now moving away from Earth. It's, you know, beyond Mars. It's almost towards Jupiter over here. The trips were taking a bit long, and that's fine. But look at the neat little information we have here. It says it's sending... Well, I guess I can't zoom in anymore. There's nothing else to see. It's sending a mineral packet to Earth. Mineral packet weighs 12 tons, and it's going at 5,000 kilometers per second. Every five days, you know, every industrial tick, which happens on every five days, Wolf Harrington over here mines a certain amount of goods, right? It's mining some duranium and some uridium over here. And as soon as it mines it, it goes into the stockpile, the mass driver then instantly flings it to Earth. So every five days right now, it's sending us 12 tons of minerals, six tons of duranium, six tons, what was the other thing, uridium? And now that's just accumulating on Earth, which is awesome, fantastic stuff. And it's moving away, I was like, the trip's taking too long, it's okay, we can add more on the next pass, or that's gonna be good enough. So this is gonna be mining for the next 100 years, apparently. We could give it some more um, automated factory, automated mines, but probably we'll just expand to some other place instead. So what I've done is my cargo ships are now starting to move infrastructure to Mars over here. And technically that instantly creates a colony and there's no one living there yet, right? Population zero, but it's got uh, 120 pieces of infrastructure and that gives it enough infrastructure to, to have a population of 0 0.6 million, so 600,000, because we need 200 infrastructure for every million people right now. So we're starting to ship that over. It's worth noting that I did finish my second freighter and I added it to task group one. Task group one is still working together. It's just following the same instructions. I just got it on an infinite move over here, pick up goods from Mars, then drop it off. No, sorry. Pick up goods on Earth, drop it off on Mars, and the refueling step in between. This will continuously reorder itself as it cycles the move, right? Basically, as it finishes one instruction, it drops it to the bottom of the list. It's the way that it works. So these two are working together, so they're shipping things twice as fast. It's worth noting Valdir 1 could probably use some crew leave in about 10 months, but we're not going to worry about it too, too much. But here's the other exciting thing. If we go to Earth over here, notice we've got a couple of blue things going on here. What is this? Well, we have... And this, this started at the, at the start of the game. As soon as we started the game, there was one private corporation got launched, the Coates Colony Corporation. As far as I know, I can't rename these, which is the only too bad thing. Well, because we finally have a colony that is properly operating, right? We've, we officially have a colony on Mars. It's got no people there yet, but we flagged it as a colony. I mean, we flagged more than one thing as a colony, but this is a colony where you can actually have people live because it's got some suitability and it's got some infrastructure over there. These guys have been uh, preparing for this. No, not you. You. These guys are preparing for this. They had some money. They just spent the money. They have two ships now. They have a total tonnage of over 100,000 tons worth of ship. They have a 64,000 ton freighter and a 38,000 ton cargo ship, which is actually carrying 100,000 human colonists. I didn't build this ship. Private individuals built this on their own and gave it their own command. People are moving to Mars. I am currently working on my own uh, cryogenic colony ship over here. It's about 20% done. It'll be done in uh, July of uh, like two years. It's gonna take a while to build this thing. It's a big ship. Someone already beat me to the punch. Look at that. I'm going to keep building my Job class ship. We'll probably just build the one. It makes me really happy that we've got this and not a slow little passenger freighter. So let's go ahead and slowly tick one day at a time here. Ooh, it moves fast too. It's got a speed of 650 kilometers a second. It's actually going to be faster than my ship. Oh, we got an inactive research lab. I'm, uh, I'm mostly putting extra research lab into jump point theory. I'm pissed off. Laura still hasn't gained any new skill, which is too bad. We'll go five days at a time. So they're dropping off some people. And guys... It's time to celebrate. It is a great day for all of humanity, for all of the Quilliverse and the Quillian Empire. There are now 100,000 people living on Mars. Amazing! Amazing! What are they going to do there? Well, we could certainly build more um, installations here. We have no installations here at all. We just have infrastructure. We have no real buildings. I mean, we could go 
and produce, you know, some mines or something like that. We'd have to ship them over some uh, resources to start off with, but, you know, we know how to do that. So we could uh, ship them some material, or we could build the mines on Earth and transfer them over here, which would be fine. But mining on Mars isn't going to make much sense, because the minerals they've got has incredibly poor accessibility. At some point, we'll do a proper geological survey here. Maybe we'll get lucky, but probably not. So mining here doesn't make much sense. So what do we do? Do we do anything? I think the answer is going to be mostly no. I don't think we're going to build installations over here. However, under the wealth slash trade tab that we haven't looked at before, there's something very interesting that can happen. First of all, um, we collect taxes, I mean, on our existing population, but not only that, but we uh, collect taxes whenever someone ships colonists around. So we're going to make some money by virtue of the fact that private individuals are shipping colonists, which is great. Soon there's going to be more than that. If we go to Earth, we're going to see something interesting. Down here, there are trade goods on Earth. Earth creates civilian transportation. They make cars, consumer electronics, so, you know, cell phones and TVs and stuff, entertainment product, uh, products, furs, etc., etc., etc. Some of these categories have a surplus right over here, and some of these actually have a shortfall. Even though we're producing a consumer electronics, there's a huge shortfall of that. There's a bigger demand for these things. Once Mars gets established, it'll create some, con uh, some consumer goods, I believe, on their own. I don't think we need factories or anything like that. I think they just start creating this and then these private freighters will ship this stuff back and forth and they will, um, and we will tax that and make even more money. What do we do with all this tax money? We haven't spent a single dollar yet. Just wait. There's some cool stuff that's going to ha start happening very soon. Now that private industry is kicking into high gear, we're going to start seeing some stuff really, really, really soon. Um, the other thing we can do with these freighters that are just sitting around right now, since they're not transporting these uh, consumer goods, what else can they do? Well, here's the thing. On Earth, we still have we still have 1,800 units of infrastructure. Now we're shipping some over to Mars, but what if we hired that commercial civilian private ship to help us ship infrastructure? And we can do that. We can say, listen, on Mars, if we go to the civilian slash industrial status screen, we can say, listen, um, Mars will, it has a demand. It's demanding I don't know a thousand infrastructure. Mars wants a thousand infrastructure. We're going to create a contract for this. They say, please, someone bring us a thousand infrastructure to Mars. Now, that by itself isn't quite enough to get things done. We have to go to Earth and say, hey, Earth can supply 1,000 infrastructure. We're just putting it out there. Earth, you know, we have a thousand infrastructure. Anyone who wants to come pick it up can come pick it up. So we have a supply of infrastructure from Earth. We have a demand of infrastructure on Mars. And we have a private freighter. If we watch this dude here, um, Coates, he's actually already getting ready to move to the Earth trade location, which is at Earth. And if we wait one day, he's loading stuff on Earth. If we wait a little bit longer. He is now uh, going to Mars. He's still got a timer going on. There we go. He's going to go to Mars and unload those installations. So now this private ship, this shipping company, this freaking Coates, what is it called? Coates Shipping? Coates Colony Corporation is not only moving colonists to Mars, they're helping move the infrastructure to Mars, which the colonists are gonna to use to survive. Once we move all the infrastructure over there, uh, we'll have enough infrastructure to support a population on Mars of 10 million people. We'll probably need to build more installations later on, but for now, that's gonna be pretty good. Now, there's gonna be some, I didn't, apparently I missed Mars. Let's just go through here. One thing we're gonna to start to see on this screen, we don't see it yet. So on Earth, we've got this thing called requested protection level. 395. Actual protection level, zero. This is how defended the population of this planet feel. Now, on Earth, this is not causing any distress. I don't know if there's something different hard-coded about Earth because it's a capital or something like that, or I don't know if it's because of the ground units. I know ground units can lower unrest, but I would suspect um, that we should still get a message on Earth about unrest. I think it's probably because it's a capital that might be immune to it. But when Mars grows a little bit longer, a little bit bigger, they're going to get that uh, protection request in there. I'm not blind, right? It's not in there? No. It will come in there, and then we're going to start seeing a little bit of unrest. The political stability is going to start to drop, and that's going to hurt some of our production on Mars, and they're just going to get cranky. We're getting to the point where we're going to need a little bit of military stuff. I mean, we got to keep the Martian population under control. I have complete and utter dominant over Earth because I have melded my brain with the internet, and um, if people don't obey me, they're not going to get their funny cat pictures. So... You know, I've got them pinned down. But Mars, I mean, I've watched Total Recall. I know that Martians can sometimes consider um, the possibility of rebelling. That's not going to be appropriate. So we're going to have to start thinking in terms of military. Now, I don't think we actually need to build ships quite yet. 
I think we could get away with PDCs, which should help. We might also be able to um, help by moving some of our um, our ground units, which we've got on Earth. We might be able to move some of these to Mars and have that help um, pacify the population, I think. Prevent increase in political status. Ah, uh, population will not progress the next political status. So that's the thing. So Earth's political status is imperial population. Mars, still imperial population. But there's got to be an internal status that I don't know about. Oh, hey, Mars needs a, a planetary governor. Also, we can assign a sector governor somewhere that I hadn't looked at before. But yeah, let's, um, civilian administrators. We actually have three colonies now. Technically a fourth one, but uh, Neusman doesn't do anything. We got to take a look at this comet, though, see if it's on the way back in, because I definitely want to uh, mine that. But Mars could use a governor. Now, we're not mining on Mars. We're not factory producing on Mars. What do we care about for Mars? Um, it doesn't really matter, but we could consider... Let's take a look. Let's shop around and see who we might get. Terraforming later might be a thing. But I was going to say, wealth wouldn't be bad. Population growth also would be a relatively decent thing to get them to grow. Do we have anyone with that? There's a population growth. Factory, like shipbuilding and factory of 5%. Either one of these isn't a big deal. Ground unit construction. I'll tell you what, let's, let's assume we want Martians to start breeding. How come the other one wasn't listed? I don't know, but population growth bonus. Harry Buckley over here. Maybe that's the one I did see. Yeah, it is the one I did see. Okay, so that's the only person with population growth. Excellent. You, Harry, are going to work on Mars. Congratulations. Now, Wolf Harrington is just a mining colony. Literally, the only thing we care about there is mining bonus to get more bang for a buck. Tom O'Neill, who doesn't have any other bonuses we care about that much, although wealth creation bonus would be nice, you are going to be assigned to Wolf Harrington. You're going to give your 30% mining bonus to there. Congratulations. You are going to be living all by yourself on a comet that is currently flinging its way out of the solar system. It's going to be you and a bunch of automated mines. Try not to go crazy, Tom. And then we don't need to assign anyone else anywhere else, so that's going to be groovy. Uh, all right. I think we will want to build a troop transport, because I think I will want to move troops over to Mars. Um, I, that was the thing. Remember when I was designing my two transports? I'm like, wasn't there something else I was going to do? That's what I was trying to remember, is I want to build a troop transport. Do we have the troop transport tech? Let me copy the job over here. Go to design view. Obviously, we'll pull out the cryogenic transport. No, we don't have troop transportation, so we'll have to research that. Do I want to supplant anything else? I still don't have a logistics guy. Oh, I did get a defense person, finally. Evie Buckley over here is someone with defense tech, defensive systems, which is great. I'm having her research duranium armor. So, interesting thing, um, and I like this mechanic. Right now, all of our ships... All of our ships. So if we look at, um, I don't know, our scout ship, the Speedy Savant, it has one layer of armor rating. It has an armor rating of one. If we research uranium, which is better armor than what these guys have, I don't know what the, these guys' armor is. It doesn't list it. It just like gives you like a, a stat, basically. Um, it doesn't tell me what the actual thing is. Maybe a component. Conventional armor. So right now we have conventional armor. Um, next, uh, uh, we're going to research uranium armor. Now, uranium armor... So let's say we redesign the Speedy Savant. We keep it exactly the same, except we'll have it use Duranium Armor. Will it be tougher and harder to kill? The answer is no, because we're still just going to have an armor rating of 1. The difference will be, because Duranium is stronger than conventional armor, that armor will be thinner and lighter. So effectively, all we'll do, we'll have exactly the same defensive stat, but our ship will be lighter. And that will be excellent. Now, of course, obviously, if we were designing a military ship, if we, have, if we research an armor technology, that weighs half as much as the previous armor technology for the same defensive value, then we're not just going to have a lighter military ship. Instead, what we're going to do is have a military ship with the same weight. We're just going to stack twice as much armor on there. So higher armor technologies does lead to more defensiveness in a sense. But if you literally don't need the protection, like on these survey ships, if we don't care about armor on these things, it just makes the ship lighter, which means they move faster. And it's, it's excellent. It's great. Um, how does armor work? We haven't really discussed this. What does this mean, armor 1-21? Let's start with the second number first. The second number basically is how big your ship is. Sort of, uh, this, imagine the, the circumference of the sh the, your, your, your ship. This ship is so big that it takes 21 plates of armor stacked side by side to completely surround this ship. If we this is the Speedy Savant, which is small. If we look at the Valdir, which is a huge freighter, 
it has 92 plates of armor to wrap all the way around it. Oh, apparently you can edit the text here. What? There we go. Okay, That's, that was weird. Um, it's just bigger around, so it takes 92 plates to sur completely surround it. Again, the, the point purpose of armor, the reason you always need at least one point of armor is because armor keeps the oxygen out in and the space out. So, the Valdir is that big around. When a ship gets shot, basically what happens is the attacking weapon rolls a random number to figure out which plate got hit. So if the Valdir was shot, an attacking ship would roll from 1 to 92. It would be randomized, and it rolls 47. So plate 47 got hit. And assuming it was hit with a damage that did one dam a weapon that did exactly one damage, plate 47 would be vaporized and eliminated. There'd be a hole in the hull there. The ship would still be fine, though, at that point. The ship would be totally fine. If the ship was shot a second time, and let's say we roll the dice, and this time we hit uh, plate number 90. Plate number 90 got hit, and again, plate number 90 gets vaporized and goes to zero. Now, that's assuming we're being hit by a weapon that does exactly one damage. What if we got hit by a weapon that did two damage instead? It partially depends on the weapon type. Let's assume we're using a laser beam. A laser beam is very focused, very concentrated weapon. So in the case of a laser beam that does exactly two damage, let's say it rolls the dice, it hits plate number 70, which is still intact. So it does two damage. So the first point of damage vaporizes the plate of armor. But the, the laser does two damage. The second damage is still there. Well, the second damage penetrates and then hits a system inside the ship. It's quasi-randomized. I'm sure there's rules based on size and blah, 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 blah. But it's going to pick one of these systems and it's going to hit that system. And then the question is, does the system get destroyed? Well, it depends on the system. The HTK, that's hits to kill. Let's say the laser decided that it hit the bridge, right? So it penetrated the armor, it still had one damage left over, and it hit the bridge. The bridge hit the kill is one, this would destroy the bridge. If instead it hit fuel storage, fuel storage has a hit to kill of six. We're hitting it with one damage. What that means is there'd be a one in six chance that the fuel storage would be destroyed at that point. I don't know if it accumulates damage, it may or may not, I'm not sure, like maybe it still removes an HTK, I'm not sure, but I know for the first one, it would basically be a 1 in 6 chance of the fuel storage being destroyed, and then what does that mean for the ship? Well, I don't know, it depends. Um, so that's the way it works. Now, that's a laser. Other weapons don't necessarily penetrate as deeply, they tend to spread across the surface a bit more. Um, a missile is an excellent example of that. Let's say we got hit instead by a missile that did 2 damage, and it hit roll a dice let's say it hits armor plate number 20. that means so it's two damage missile so it hits armor plate 20 it vaporizes armor plate 20 and then it still has one damage left over well a missile doesn't penetrate the same way instead it sort of spreads out it does a crater of effective damage so it actually hit the plate next to it so it would vaporize plate 20 and 21. it wouldn't destroy any any components inside the ship but it would obliterate more of the armor and depending on what weapon you use, there's a bit of a different pattern. I should, um, let me bring up Notepad. And the pattern that these weapons use, let me increase the font. Do, 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 do. I don't know, 36, that should be good. And actually, let's get a monospace font. Oh, Consolas is probably a monospace font. Okay. So this is for laser. This is the pattern that a laser does. So a laser that does one damage. Um, does, hits there. A laser that does two damage hits there and then underneath it, which may or may not destroy a, um, a system. A laser that does three damage does this, this, and this. So it's now penetrating three layers in. Again, if you have three layers of armor in a row, they've all been vaporized. So let's say our, our armor is three thick. So far, we've been assuming that our armor is all one thick. But if we do this um, on my new ship, if we do this, now we have armor that's three layers thick. It also increased our width just a little bit, but it's three layers thick. So now that would vaporize all three layers, or if we had less than three layers, this would start damaging internal systems. What's really interesting is when a laser that does four damage, it doesn't go, it doesn't do this. That is not a four damage laser. Instead, this is a four damage laser. Now a five, I don't remember. I think a five damage laser does that? But don't quote me on it. And then maybe a six and like a seven damage laser might do something like this. So a seven damage laser would penetrate the seventh layer. Don't quote me on this. I might be wrong about the pattern for laser. 
Missiles do this. One damage is this. Two goes like this. It splashes to the side. Three does this. So again, it's splashing wide. If you hit with a four damage missile, this is the pattern. And with a five, um, I think it's that. It's either that or it's this. But basically, uh, with missile, the rule of thumb is you try to design missiles that have a square amount of damage, like a square. So one is one squared. The next one would be two squared, which would be a four. The next one after that would be a nine squared. And the reason for that is with nine pieces of damage, the pattern would be this. If you, you design your missiles to have damage equal to a square number, it guarantees that it's just enough to penetrate the next tier. Because after that, the next one, I think, um, I think does this, this, this. I think this is how missiles grow. And then it's only at that point. Right, instead of going wide, then the next piece of damage would do this. So at this point, presumably, we are at four squared. If you add this all up, this should be 16, right? Seven plus five is 12, plus four is 15, and then 16, so that's four squared. So you, dam you design your missiles to have a square amount of damage. That being said, if there's any shields involved, all the math goes away. Anyway, so that's a big, long discussion that may or may not be interesting to you. But all that to be said, getting new types of armor doesn't increase your defensiveness, but makes armor lighter, which means you can stack on more armor plates, is effectively the idea. What were we doing? Oh, transport ships. Um... Yeah, we still don't have anyone with logistics, which is really, 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 really annoying to me. What kind of PDCs do we design these days? Probably not enough. So the PDC is the, the planetary defense thing. Um, so if we start a new one. PDC. Remove that. Yeah, this will remove things because a PDC doesn't generally need, like, well, it's got fuel storage, but it actually doesn't need the fuel storage most of the time. But uh, it doesn't need engineering because it's planet-based, so it doesn't need its own engineering supply or anything like that. So it's got the bridge, crew quarters, conventional armor. Then we could give it some guns. I mean, we could give it some, like, ICBM stuff. Uh, you'll notice if we add an ICBM solo silo to this. So this is now a missile base that can fire ICBMs. You'll notice that this has a, something called PPV. That's the planetary protection value. If we drop this, if we built this missile base on Earth, if we look at Earth, the summary over here, See, it needs, it requests a protection value of 395. If we built one of those, which had a PPV of what? What was it, 24? I've already forgotten. 24. So that would be a 24 in the bottom number over here. So we'd have to build, I don't know, 15 of them, however the math works out, to meet the protection value requested. Or we could just make it bigger, right? Um, we could add more silos. We could build one giant planetary defense base there to satisfy its entire PPV. This would be a 22,000 ton planetary defense base. It would only take half a year to build, which isn't that much really, I, I guess. Um, and there are, it can also be prefabricated, which is interesting. We could prefabricate this base on earth. It would be 10 sections. Each section I believe fits in a standard 25,000 ton cargo module, although I might be wrong about this. Um, and then we could transport this to Mars and then assemble it on Mars, even though Mars doesn't have its own production uh, facilities. And then we'd have a nice defensive thing um, on Mars. It's classified as a cruiser, which is sort of a little bit silly. You have just like a PDC category? Planetary Defense Center. There we are. Annapolis class planetary defense center. So we could do something like that. I I'm not sure how we're gonna play it. Uh, and certainly I think I would like a proper tech. Uh, we haven't designed any guns yet, right? We've researched a few beam weapons. So we could look into designing beam weapons. So beam, oh, that's fire control. Um, oh, there we go, Mison cannons. Oh, what do we need? Mison focusing technology. We haven't gotten any of that yet? No, we haven't. So the, I was thinking of making some point defense guns like this. So this would protect us from um, missiles fired at our planet. It's definitely the sort of thing we probably want on our base. So we're gonna have to research that focusing technology. So I think that's the sort of thing that's going to happen um, in the future. Not not in the too distant future, because again, as soon as Mars' population starts to grow a little bit, they're going to start to complain and want protection. Which we could do by building ships, but we could also do by building some ground defenses. And I might just build some ground defenses. I think I might want to hold off on our military ships until we have sort of a critical mass of technologies to make some really awesome ones. But going forward, here's the plan for the future, in general. Going forward, we are going to want to grow the Mars colony. We're going to want to set up a little bit more mining 
around things. And once we finish researching jump point theory, we'll be able to develop gravitational survey sensors as opposed to geological survey sensors. Gravitational survey sensors will let us scout. I guess I hid that, didn't I? Did I hit, hide the jump points? I must have. There, geological survey points. So scattered around things, or no? Where's my gravitational? It's not that. I'm going crazy, you guys. Oh, there we go. Jump point surveys. So we've got all these numbered jump points around our system over here. See that? Each one of these, if you equip a ship with a gravitational survey sensor, you can have it go out to each one of these points and it'll do a gravitational survey of your solar system. And every now and again, when it explores these jump points, it will detect a, or these are these are just survey points. Every now and again, when it completes one of these gravitational surveys, it may detect a jump point. And it won't be at the same spot. It'll be somewhere else random. I actually had one game where it like, a very scary one. It showed up between the sun and Mercury, I think, which was like, my God, literally right in the middle of my star system. Yeah. Jump points are places where you can do hyperspace jumps to other systems, to and from those systems, which means it's possible. Assuming we had, you know, another one here, enemy ships, if there's an enemy in that other solar system, it could come through the jump point to here and be like right in the middle of things, which would be terrifying, terrifying. So we will start to find those. And then we can equip a ship with a jump drive and have it jump through the jump point and explore another system. We can also build jump gates. So there's two ways to go through, well, in a way, three ways to go through a jump point. One, you can build a jump gate, at which point any ship can just use the jump gate to go through the jump point to the other system. And if you build a jump point, a jump gate on the other side, then you can have tra traffic that goes in both ways. Awesome. The other thing you can do is you can put a jump drive on a ship and then a ship with a jump drive can jump itself. It can go to a jump point and jump through it itself and it can come back whenever it wants, even without a jump gate. There's a third way. There's uh, a set of technology over here. It's under power and propulsion right here. Oh, right. I have to finish jump gate, jump point theory first before we see it. But what will happen is your ships can actually bring ships with them. You could have a task group that's got um, one ship with a jump drive and then have another couple of ships in there that don't have jump drives. But your, your ship with a jump drive will have a technology rating that can, it says, I can bring with me up to a total of three ships uh, that weigh no more than 5,000 tons or something like that. So you can have one jump system in your task group that can jump your entire fleet, which is very cool and adds a lot of options. In fact, if unless I'm wrong, I believe you can just park a ship at a jump gate and it will automatically, anyone who wants to jump through there, it will automatically ferry people back and forth without having you having to micromanage things, which is pretty excellent. Um, but when we do that, we might start to meet some alien races. So before I actually go and jump through any of these jump points, I'm going to want a bit of a Navy. And certainly I'm gonna want some planetary defenses. I'm gonna want some anti-missile defense on my planets. And frankly, I might wanna be able to launch missiles from my planets, and that might make me feel good enough. So the very least, Mars and Earth, um, I'm gonna to try to have colonies in both of those and try to get them have some missile defense. Uh, we might set one up on Mars, or sorry, on the moon, and it might also need some missile defense. It's possible that the Earth will be able to cover Mars, or the moon. There might be enough range from Earth to cover the moon, in which case we'll only need the one in there. And maybe that'll be our design, um, our design philosophy. We will try to design our PDCs with a sufficient range so that a PDC on Earth will be able to protect the moon at exactly the same time. And that would be pretty sweet. So those are all plans for the future, guys. I hope you guys are enjoying this series. Um, I've recorded the last, I, what did we do, four episodes? This is episode four. I recorded these back to back. I'm eager to get them uploaded, to get some feedback from people, see if they're interested in these series, see if they've got any more questions. Um, I will, there may be a, a day or two pause between this episode and the next one as I collect more um, comments from YouTube and try to take those things into account. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time.